I'm Marian Blute and I'm Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of Toronto. In the 19th century, the first half of the 20th century, most social scientists, sociologists, and anthropologists did consider themselves evolutionists. The problem was that they had the wrong model. Their model was developmental. It actually was directly derived from German embryology. It was a model of growth and differentiation and functional integration. Uh, it was not a population model. Herbert Spencer is a good example. He didn't take his inspiration from Darwin. He tells us in his autobiography how he took his inspiration from the German embryologists. Another good example is Talca Parsons, who dominated sociological theory in the mid-20th century. In the last book that he published, he told us how his theory of change was exactly analogous to the growth and development of an organism. So what people today, including me, uh, and talking about Darwinian culture or Darwinian sociocultural evolution, is trying to make the model evolutionary rather than just developmental. So you have to have a populational model, you have variation in population, you have transmission by social learning, and selection. So it's a, a Darwinian rather than a developmental model of evolution. The old one should be called development. This is evolution, cultural evolution. A lot of social scientists are very historically oriented. Um, a lot of social scientists are very scientifically oriented. They deal with how social forces push and pull people around. But the Darwinian model includes both of those and shows how they're related. That is, common descent is the historical side of evolution, and natural selection is the causal or scientific side of natural selection. So while, while the historical side deals with historically individuals, entities, which David Hall showed and Michael Beeson showed, are historical entities, they call, it, they call it individuals. The scientific side tries to find universal, universal principles that are not a branch of the tree of life, but that are scattered across the tree of life. So for example, you might have general, uh, general principles that explain under what circumstances would you expect to find small, fast-growing and developing things. And they would be scattered across the tree of life. And in principle, they're looking for universal laws, whereas the historical side, the phylogenetic side of evolution, is dealing with historical individual entities, you know, plates, common ancestor, and all of those descendants. Well, there are a lot of terms used to describe this approach. Evolutionary epistemology is one. All knowledge acquiring and utilizing processes are selection processes. Some people call it evolutionary epistemology, some call it uh, universal Darwinism. Daniel Dennett called it sele uh, selection as a substratum neutral algorithm, very complicated. Um, there are a lot of different terms that have been used for it. Um, but they all carry the same idea. Either some people interpret it as these are analogies to biological evolution, or Evolutionary theory is a general theory of which each of these processes are special cases, in special instances. And they include cultural evolution, but they also include individual learning by reinforcement and punishment is quite a detailed evolutionary analog, as are certain aspects of the adaptive immune response. So these are, in some people's views, all aspects of a universal Darwinism or generalized Darwinism or evolutionary epistemology. There are the three approaches, straight, the biological, the purely cultural, and the co-evolutionary dealing with their interactions. Those are fairly clear classifications, and there's lots of work to be done on all three of those. Um, within one of them, let's say within the cultural evolution, just as within the biological, there's two major branches, and one, one of those branches has two sub-branches. And they follow Darwin's principles. Common descent, and that's the work on phylogenetics in the cultural era, cultural phylogenetics. And that's a very flourishing area of research today. There's a lot of cultural uh, phylogenetics being done in archaeology, historical linguistics, cultural anthropology, and so on. Uh, the other branch is evolutionary ecology, which deals with Darwin's second principle, the selection. And that's a side of it that I know most about, I've been most involved with. Um, under what conditions should we expect selection to favor what kind of circumstances, what kind of traits, uh, life history evolution, growth versus reproduction, 
growth versus maintenance, offspring quality versus offspring quality, those kinds of things. And then the, the co-evolutionary. And that, that selectionist side, the historical side and the selectionist side, the selectionist side, there's two sub-branches to that, the ecological, dealing with the ecological environment, and the social side, because things evolve in interaction with the ecological environment, but they also evolve in interaction with other members of the same population. So for example, you have things like kin selection, things like sexual selection, and so on. So the, I think there's a fairly clear classification of these, and there's lots of work to be done in all of them. A lot of people think that the problem with culture, the unit's problem with culture, is greater than the unit's problem with biology than it is. There's an enormous unit's problem with biological evolution. We all talk about genes, but we don't know what genes are anymore. Um, in culture, each discipline, each of the social sciences, has their traditional units, the way they describe the world. And for the most part, those can be used in, evolu in an evolutionary framework. So in sociology, we commonly talk about norms and values, rules, um, and these aggregated social roles or statuses, and those aggregated to organizations and institutions. Um, economists would have slightly different terms. Anthropologists would have slightly different terms. That in all these cases you have different levels of aggregation and each discipline has its own terms and I don't think that's going to go away, but they can all be used in the ocean. The modern synthesis was a great intellectual achievement. As I mentioned before, it, it combined a theory of heredity with a theory of evolution. Um, but in the, in the immediate post-Darwinian period there was a lot of um, dispute over different schools. So it was a great intellectual achievement. But today there's more discontent again. And that's not surprising. I mean, David Hall showed us in his, in his book Science as a Process uh, that concepts and theories of science vary. They change. They evolve. So evolutionary theory is not going to stay the same. It's going to continue to evolve and change. And today a lot of people are arguing that we need an extended synthesis. And one of the things that I think needs to be included is a greater attention to culture and the role of, of cultural evolution in an extended synthesis. As well as the things I mentioned before, the development of ecology. On the co-evolution side, uh, gene culture co-evolution, I've made a modest contribution. Um, one of the things that's important in co-evolution is the mode of transmission. If genes and culture are transmitted vertically to the same individuals, then you have a certain kind of relationship. We've often understood that as a plus-plus mutualistic relationship, and if, they're, if culture's transmitted horizontally, it can often be parasitic. But nobody's ever clearly made clear the concept of what happens when it's oblique, when it's transmitted between generations, but at an angle, so to speak, to somebody else's children, so to speak. Um, there was a, a original article, a book published many years ago, that um, that first introduced those concepts of vertical, horizontal, and oblique transmission. It didn't really make clear the concept of oblique transmission and what it means. And I think I showed in an article that oblique transmission is a minus-minus relationship. Um, the simplest example I can think of, to make it simple, is you had two clans or lineages, let's say, in, you know, anthropologically, we're the wolves and you're the bears, and each are endogamous, they marry in. But what if the children of wolves become bears culturally, and children of bears become wolves culturally. Then you have a, 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 a conflict relationship between genes and culture. So anything you do for your biological offspring is what you can't do for your cultural offspring. And whatever you do for your cultural offspring, contribute resources or help them, is things you can't do for your biological offspring. So genes and culture are in a minus-minus or antagonistic relationship under oblique transmission. Evolution is change in the inductive control of development by ecology. So that first part of it means that you can have old genes in a new environment. The environment can do simply a phenotypic change and that can eventually lead to evolutionary change. The second part of it is that and or uh, change in the, in the constructive control of, of ecology by development. So you can have a new genetic mutation or recombination and that can lead to evolutionary change. So evolutionary change can include both genes as followers, 
starting with environmental influence on phenotypes, or genes as leaders, starting with genetic mutations or recombinations. It can develop either, it can happen either way, or both together, but that's not very likely. I published a monograph with Cambridge University Press on Darwinian sociocultural evolution, solutions to dilemmas in cultural and social theory. It made the case for mm -hmm. sociocultural evolution and particularly made the case that it can solve certain dilemmas that are very general problems in the social sciences, like conflict and cooperation, the ideal and the material, history as opposed to scientific approach, Darwin's two major principles, his common descent, dealing with the historical side, and his natural selection, dealing with the, the uh, causal scientific sort of side. So I think that evolutionary theory can integrate many of these different issues in social and cultural theory. So that was a monograph I published.